Yeah, so uh, we're on to the, one of the reasons uh, that you're here, I suppose. Uh, we're pleased uh, to have David Price uh, to come and share um, his, uh, his ideas with us. Uh, he's an author, a keynote speaker, and worked globally around um, supporting organisations, countries, um, and so much more around their open approach to education and everything else alongside it as well. Uh, David will be delivering a keynote on unleashing the power of us, um, education post-COVID. So please put your questions in the chat um, in the chat box, um, and we'll put the Q&As to David after. Um, as you've seen, my Wi-Fi probably isn't performing great today. So what we've done uh, with David is we've done a pre-recording just to make sure that nothing falls over uh, because we want you to get the, the best of David and we don't want you to get the, the stuttering robot of David. So over to you, over to David. Strange giving talks like this. There's no getting around it. It's it's I think it's a poor substitute for being in a room with people. But but that's what lockdown does to you, I guess. Um and what it's done to me, I suppose, is that made me never ever want to eat sourdough bread again. Um Yes, like most people, I made it and then realized it was just bread at the end of the day. Um, it might be fancy, but it's just bread. So then I thought, oh, orchids, they're nice. I'll, I'll buy a few orchids. And my wife thinks that we're, we're running an orchid farm now because I bought more than I should have done, put it that way. And then I got a little bit bored from that. So I thought, OK, well, we'll go back, return to our first love, which is music. And I um, put together a music video of about... 100 educators from around the world um, and we sang a song in tribute to the care workers um, I enjoyed it, it was good fun uh, but even then I started getting a bit bored so I thought, there's nothing else for it I'm going to have to write the book um, and this is it it's out on August the 28th I didn't start writing it during lockdown I just want to make that clear I've actually been writing it for three years um, it's called The Power of Us, How We Connect, Act and Innovate. It's out on Thread Books. Please buy it. Um, and as I say, I, I, I rewrote it because of one thing and another. Um, you, can't, you can't really write a book during coronavirus and not refer to it. So I kind of rewrote the whole book. Also, there were some amazing things which were highly pertinent to the book. So I thought, OK, let's rewrite it. Um, and about halfway through that process, which was about two weeks ago when I started reconstructing the whole book, I came across this quote from Tom Friedman, who's a journalist in the New York Times, who I respect the hell out of. He's a fantastic journalist. And he said, whatever nonfiction book you're working on now, put it down. There's a world before Corona and there's a world after Corona. And we've got no idea what the world after Corona is going to look like. Well, that was advice that I didn't really take. Um, partly because I think he missed a bit out. I think the bit between those two worlds is, is really important and, and we shouldn't overlook it. That's DC, the world during corona. And I think we've learned so much about ourselves as a species um, that I want to start the talk really with what I think are the four um, key lessons that we've learned. Uh, and then I want to move into um, how we got to, to be at that point of development um, because it, it was going on before Corona. And then finally, we'll look at uh, afterwards what this what this means for all our students and for education. So let's start with the lessons learned. The first one is that communities outperform bureaucracies. Um, this is particularly true if you're a UK citizen, it seems to me. Well, an English citizen, I think. Uh, in Scotland, you might have a different view, and, and, and I'd support you in that. Um, but it's not just England. It's also um, <clears throat> the US. We've seen governments around the world failing to act quickly enough, decisively enough, failing to get on top of it, whilst at the same time, small grassroots communities have been able to respond amazingly well and incredibly fast. Uh, so BrewDog, which I consider to be a community-run organization, it's owned by its community. Overnight, BrewDog shifted from brewing beer to making uh, hand gel sanitizers because there was, a, there was a shortage of it. They turned their delivery vans into delivering lunches for vulnerable people. Um, and they just did it on a sixpence overnight. Um, 
we saw this explosion of mutual aid groups. Um, in the first week of lockdown, there were over a thousand mutual aid groups were formed on Facebook. Um, and they're still going. They're still supporting local communities. And it's been a great irony, it seems to me, that during the period when we're locked down and isolated, we've probably never been as well connected. Um, and there's something to be learned from that. Uh, and one of the people I wrote about in the book is a guy called Pan Pansiarka. And Pan um, is not a medical expert, but he runs a, a medical research project called the Redo Project. Um, and it looks into the use of uh, repurposed drugs. Now, before Corona, nobody had heard of repurposed drugs, but is actually finding drugs that might have been developed for one use, but actually they work very well in other uses. And Pan's particular interest is in cancer drugs. But of course, when coronavirus happened, they then repurposed themselves and they are tracking currently over a thousand clinical trials of repurposed drugs, one of which was hydri hydroxychloroquine, um, which didn't work. But the other one was uh, dexamethasone, which did work. Um, and as I say, they've repurposed their whole um, reason for being and they did it overnight. And then finally, just one giant lab, which is a, a, a club of 4,000 people based in France, but it's global. And it's people of all kinds of disciplines. So it's engineers, it's educators, it's medics, it's hobbyists, it's makers. Uh, and they are dedicated to finding solutions, um, not just for the shortage of PPE, but for coronavirus itself. So it seems to me that we're realizing that small grassroots community run organizations can respond quicker and often more effectively than bureaucracies. The thing that we're learning is timescales don't really count for anything now. You know, if you just look at the Oxford vaccine group to see that, it, it used to be that development of vaccine took 10 years. Well, they're probably going to do it inside of 12 months which is an astonishing achievement. And it is a partnership between themselves and AstraZeneca. But it, it, it is more than likely that if it works, everyone watching this will have been vaccinated around about the turn of the year, within uh, uh, certainly within 18 months. Uh, and, and that never used to be the case. So the standard period for clinical trials was 10 to 15 years, and now we just measure it in weeks. Surely we're not going to go back to, to that. Um, some of you may have heard of the partnership between Mercedes, the Formula One development team and UCL Hospital, when they realized that because the ventilators um, uh, weren't really working because it was too late if, if people had to be put on a ventilator, they got together and created uh, a new design for a continuous breathing machine. They did it from the initial meeting to producing the first of 10,000 continuous breathing machines. They did it in under 100 hours. Astonishing. Um, and really, one of the reasons why these groups are able to respond so quickly is that peer production is driven by passion, not protocols. And that's, that's what we've seen. And it is leading to uh, an ugly word, and I'm sorry I'd have to use it, but it's a thing called cosmolocalism. Uh, and what that essentially means is you design globally, but you make locally. And that is turning the traditional model on its head, because it used to be that intellectual property was closely guarded and you produced whatever it was you were making in, in your global factories around the world but it was all centralized. Now, as I say, that model's turned on its head. What was scarce, which was ideas, is now plentiful through the open source movement. But because materials are now becoming scarce, then we, we, we have to make them locally. So all of the examples I'm gonna give are examples of cosmolocalism in action. And, and people are saying this will be the new mode of production going forward. So this is an example of um, uh, the, the um, 3D printed uh, prosthetic limbs, which Matt Botel of Melbourne uh, has created, his, his social enterprise. Uh, you, you'll make them for a dollar, 
and 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 give them to developed nations. But he also has made the designs available for anyone. And people now all over the world are making these prosthetic limbs because all you need is a 3D printer. Um, these, this girl here, you see, um, she's an Afghan student, and in Afghanistan, they're making makeshift ventilators, um, and they're doing it from Toyota parts. And someone made an open source design, and, and people all over Afghanistan have been developing this. And then the one that you're probably most familiar with, because literally thousands of students around the world have been doing this, um, they've been making these face shields when there was a shortage of them. Uh, and and the, the design for the face shields, the 3D design, it's, it's all open source. So wherever they happen to be, I work with a school in Rochdale, Matthew Moss High School. Their students started producing them as soon as there was a shortage of PPE. They delivered them to doctor surgeries. And before a week had gone, they were taking orders from all over the country. So it seems to me that this touches on what for me now is the most exciting part of, of what we've seen is that it's largely being driven by young people. And that takes us to the fourth lesson, um, which is that ideas no longer come with a date stamp. You don't have to be a certain age before people will take you seriously. So I just want to introduce you to two young men that you may not have, have come across. Um, they both essentially invented the same thing which is a COVID tracking app. Uh, Abby Schiffman lives in Washington State with his parents. He's 17 year old and he's just been named the Webby Person of the Year. For the geeks among you, you'll know that's, that's like winning the Oscar. Um, not content with that, his COVID tracking website, which, which is actually the most used COVID website in the US, um, all the epidemiologists use it because they want up to date information and it's constantly being updated. But he wasn't happy just with that. When the George Floyd protests started happening, he produced a website which tracks Black Lives Matter protests all around the world. It's amazing if you go on it. Um, he's 17. Kid on the right, I heard about. He's 19, Ryan Jun Seong Hong. Um, again, he lives with his parents in Seoul in South Korea. And when Korea had this explosion. I don't know if you remember, but it was a religious sect and, and they'd, they'd done really well keeping the virus under control and then things took off. Well, he produced a, a COVID tracking app which would alert you on your mobile phone if you were in an area in a part of the country where there'd been someone recently who was infected. Um, he did it in three days and at the at the height of the outbreak, when the numbers were starting to escalate in Korea, he was getting 300,000 hits per day. Now contrast that with the UK's attempt at doing a COVID tracking app, which of course the UK wouldn't just take the one that everybody's been using. These two were using the Google Apple um, platform. No, no, they had to develop their own at 250 million pounds cost to admit that actually it wouldn't actually work with iPhones. So they've now said that the, the, the next version of the app will be ready hopefully before Christmas. That's at least six, seven, if not more months. A 19 year old kid living with his parents can do it in three days. What does that tell you? So I was really interested in what was the motivation behind these young kids because it seems to me we've got lessons to learn about what's driving them. Because if we think that the students that we've been looking after who've been making face shields are going to be happy to come back in September and fill in worksheets, we are sadly mistaken. Um, so I wanted to get an idea of what's, what's driving them. Um, this is Avi. As I say, 17-year-old, lives in Washington State. Uh, and he recently did a, an interview with uh, MIT. And he said, I was a really bad student. <laughs> I had a 1.7 grade point average. I focused my time on programming related stuff. I couldn't focus in any class. I'd stay up late working on programming. My attendance rate was 60%. I could have made something really big and lived the rest of my life in the Bahamas. And I sort of planned to go to college eventually. Maybe? Mm, probably won't go to college. I'm working on more interesting things. This is the challenge. 
we can't go back to the old normal. The next normal has got to be different. Um, so Ryan, I reached out to Ryan because it's so easy these days. When I heard about this COVID tracking app and I said to him, what was, what was driving you and, and, and what do your friends think? that the world's going to be, be like after this? What, what, where, where did they see their part in the world? And this is what he said. He said, our generation should really take advantage of this to deal with bigger challenges ahead. I'd love to build a charitable organisation to serve people because throughout this journey of Corona Map Live, that's his website, I found out that I was never happier than this in my entire life. I started helping people without expecting anything. I wouldn't have had the same feeling if I'd decided to monetize it. I learned that it was way more powerful than money. Way more powerful than money. And these are not exceptions, these kids. I could have filled my book three times over with kids like this. They're everywhere. And this was happening before COVID. And it'll be happening after COVID as well. So I want to just talk a little bit about what I think is actually going on here. It seems to me that this... Uh, outbreak of peer production, I call it mass ingenuity. This wave of mass ingenuity was going to happen anyway because of what I call the three stages of sharing. So first of all, we shared what we knew. So Twitter, YouTube, you know, what we're doing now is sharing what we know. But that led to sharing what we owned. So Airbnb, uh, the let schemes of contributing your skills um, in exchange for not money but credit. And now we're at the really exciting part, the part which the governor, former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, has called the artisanal economy, which is about sharing what we create. And if you are unclear as to what this is, you just got to go on websites like Etsy or Patreon. It's people finding a market for what they make. And, and you can do that now. Now, there was a fourth stage that I began to speculate in the book. I was speculating as to whether it, it, it would reach scale. It seems to me that there is now the opportunity because the two blockers to peer production at scale were historically access to the means of capital and access to the means of production. Now, with peer-to-peer -peer lending services online uh, and 3D printers costing less than $1,500, that's no longer the case. So... It's an exciting time. What does it mean for education after coronavirus? Well, I think one of the things is that we're seeing new forms of activism. Black Lives Matter is one, the climate emergency, the Extinction Rebellion people, remember that? That wasn't that long ago. They completely tore up the rule book about how you do protest and, and with, with incredible success. Similarly, the Me Too movement, the two largest public demonstrations ever in the history of our species were organized by school kids. That was the Parklands, Florida kids, the March for Our Lives March, and then the March that Greta Thunberg organized. So this is what I mean about, I think the exciting part is that kids themselves are driving this. Um, we are, like I said, seeing communities outperforming bureaucracies, and that also applies to education. So in America, we're seeing uh, the, the rise of things called the teacher-powered schools. So where, where educators are, are taking more of the decisions at the point where they need to be taken, the closest point to the classroom. Um, and I suspect we'll see that happen now in schools and colleges. I think we're seeing leaders who've developed um, uh, a newfound courage in resisting government. Um, and, and we'll see that sense of community more. Uh, the development of time skills also applies to education. You know, the number of people who, who ummed and aahed about blended learning and whether it could happen. And then when we were forced to do it, they did it in three weeks. So surely we're not going to go back. We, we have to now accept that blended learning is just going to be part of, of education going forward. When we put education back together again after corona, we have to do it with users, students, parents, communities at the heart of it. They've got to be the people who are innovating, not just ourselves. And I think we should seize this opportunity for what it is, which is a chance to let global challenges drive the curriculum. Because let's be honest, this isn't going to be the only 
global crises that our young people are going to be facing in their lives. The climate emergency is queuing up. We've got mass migration. Hell, we've got the biggest economic depression that we'll probably have ever seen in our history. And it's our young people who are going to have to solve this. So I've been arguing for a while that we should have more place-based curricula. We should be developing ecosystems where we're trying to solve problems. And, and we, have, we have the opportunity now. So if we have the courage to seize this moment, I think we will see that schools and colleges will see the revival of their communities as their prime responsibility. And, and I believe it should be. And I've been working with schools who are already doing this before COVID-19 happened. We'll see that education can become the ecosystem where these future challenges become the focus of the, the learning, but it can't happen alone. We have to work with employers, we have to work with communities, and we'll be working globally. Our students have made global connections. They'll want to continue doing that. And our young people will show us the power of us because education can become the place where equity and diversity stop being slogans and they're made real. So we hear a lot about the greatest generation, the generation that uh, fought in the Second World War. My father was part of that generation. And, and, you know, we call them the greatest generation for a good reason. But they weren't the greatest generation before the war. They just needed something, the scale of which had never happened before, so that they could rise to it. What, what the great Thomas Paine said, the time found them. And, and, and I believe the time has found this generation as well. And, and they can rise to the same kind of respect, it seems to me, if we give them a chance after coronavirus. And never was it better expressed than by Greta Thunberg when she said, society's past the social tipping point. We can no longer look away from what our society has been ignoring for so long, whether it's equality, justice, or sustainability. People are starting to find their voice, to understand that they can actually have an impact. Doing our best is no longer good enough. We must now do the seemingly impossible. And that is up to you and me because no one else will do it for us. I think she's describing the power of us. And I think it's our responsibility as educators to help give them not just the tools and the knowledge, but the experiences within which they can demonstrate the power of us. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. And we're back and we are back. Uh, powerful stuff. Uh, and he's live with us. He's here. He's not just a robot on a screen. He is here. He's live and he's, and he's ready to go. So um, obviously we're going we're gonna to ask a couple of questions from the audience, David. Um, so hopefully you're geared up for them and you've been listening to your own presentation. That would be helpful because uh, we definitely have absolutely fantastic start to the day. Um, so we're going to go to, um, I think, a question from David Leonard uh, first. Um, we'll bring it up on the screen in a second. But Dave asked a question for David. How can we, in education, learn from DC lessons and repurpose uh, what we do to provide more to the communities that we serve? And how we, do we leverage the passion? Um, to expedite the process. Yeah, I, and, and I think Dave's hit on a really important um, point there because the, the, the point I was trying to make in the, in the um, talk was that it seems to me that we, we, through this pandemic, we have, to a degree, started to rediscover the, the, the power of localism, of, of um, collectivism, and working with your local communities and, and people are suffering and they're going to be suffering for a long, long time to come. So I, I just don't think it's fair on our young people to say that's, that's something that you just park outside the school gates. I, I, I've worked with a number of schools now, um, has to be said mainly in Australia, that have, that have redesigned their entire curriculum around the needs of the community. And it all starts with an ask. You know, these schools just went to the local council and said, what can we do? What can we do to help you? 
And they soon found that all the learning that they would traditionally be doing could be um, could be found in in doing meaningful acts um, to support the community. So I think it's a really great point that he's made. And on to our second question, and we're actually so close to the end of time, we'd really appreciate it if um, after we come off, you could go into the chat and answer a couple of the other questions a bit more fully. But for the last question of this session, and I really enjoyed your presentation, by the way, I have some really, really interesting elements. Thank I think you. the second question that we had was from Cameron Patterson. If timescales don't matter any anymore, what might that mean for the traditional notion of a year long school grade? Yeah, I, I know Cameron, um, and, and he's a bit of a rebel uh, down in Sydney. Uh, I think it's a really great question to ask because everything has been thrown up in the air. Now we don't know when the school year, it's a bit like the, the Premier League, when does the season end and when does the next season start? I, I, I don't personally think that that's uh, anything to be feared. I think we are we're moving towards a much more flexible, uh, delivery of education now, uh, not just within schools, but within colleges and universities, because universities particularly, it seems to me, have now had to reinvent themselves um, going forward beyond beyond um, COVID. So they, we, we can't just stick to the everybody starts in September or August or whenever it is, and then everybody finishes um, in, in May. Um, how we do that? Is, is it Cameron would be a, a better person to talk to, frankly, than, than myself. But it, but it, it, it will inevitably happen as um, a, a, as we see the the lessons that we're learning from the tertiary sector are starting to trickle down into FE and down into schools. So it's 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 coming. I hope so, because actually, fun fact, my sister and I are actually in the same year at school because I'm September 5th and she's August 31st the following year. So our gap in learning was actually exacerbated when I was always in top groups. She was always in lower groups when the reality is that was more down to birthdays than yeah. ability. Absolutely. I mean, why why are we still you know processing students uh, by the, the year of production? What, why? Just, be, just because you're 12 doesn't need to say you know exactly the same things as someone else who's 12. In some areas, you're going to know a lot more than someone uh, your same age. So we, we need to think about all of that as well. And, and, and that's that again, that's been happening during Corona. And we need to learn these lessons. Thank you so much, David. And this, as you say, is a perfect time for us to think about what are the lessons we're learning and what are we going to take forward? And hopefully David will be able to go into the chat and answer the questions that we didn't have time to ask because we're coming up to our first break on time. Woohoo. Um, and so our first round table is going to happen next. The break's only five minutes. Is that still exciting? I think we hope so. We hope so. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> So we'll be back at 10.45 for the next session. We'll see you then.